Um, I'm Kevin Fales, I'm a Kanakamole, Native Hawaiian, um, and it's mentioned in the music department as well as in the African American and African Diaspora Studies. Um, and I feel very privileged actually to be a part of this conversation with this distinguished panel here. Um, first though, I would like to, especially since this is an indigenous panel, uh, uh, to recognize, even recognizing the limitations of acknowledgement, to recognize that we're in the occupied land of the Lenape people. Um, so I just want to start out with that. So the first speaker today will be Hokulani Aikau, uh, the Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies and Gender Studies at the University of Utah. So I have a PowerPointy thingy. Yeah, I wanna just uh, start with a few images just to help folks see where I'm working from. So aloha o hokulani aikau ko uinua no ho au i kokorni. My name is hokulani aikau and I live um, on Shoshone lands, um, which is now called Utah. <laughs> but it is the lands of the Shoshone um, na speaking nations as well as the new home of the Northern Ute nations. And um, it is truly a pleasure to be here and speaking with you all today. I feel like we um, are in a fortunate position of following some really amazing panels that have sort of set it up for us, right? For thinking about how intersectional feminism is necessary for climate justice, how um, the continued relevance of colonialism is still ever present for many of us living, um, well, we all live on indigenous lands that are variously occupied by settler colonial nations, and so it's all still relevant today and tomorrow and into the future that we all want to build. So let's, let's stop that from happening. Um, so my presentation today is really based on some thinking that I've been doing, work that I've been doing um, in Hawaii with Kako'o OEV since 2011. Kako'o, and this is the title of a book project and some images from this place where I work. So Kako'o OEV is a Native Hawaiian nonprofit organization working to restore wetland taro farming on the windward coast of Oahu in the Ahupua'a or region of Heiia and um, in the moku of Ko'olaupoko and the name Mahuahua Ai O Hoi means the restoration of food in the place called Hoi. And Ai, the second word up there, means both food, but then it also means, um, it re refers to taro or kalo, so I'll use kalo in my presentation today, which is the Hawaiian word for taro. And if we were to take that okina, the glottal stop in front of the A, away, it also means sex so we can play with a little bit. Because my presentation today is really about the procreative power of, um, and of Kahlo. And we're gonna get there. Um, so this project is a key node in the Ahupua'a food system. And Ahupua'a is a region, it's a watershed. Um, but it's also a key, key node in a food, restoration of food system that's happening in this region and a site of ingenuity and and creativity and a site of struggle as average everyday people, Kanaka and allies alike, work side by side to restore the health and well being of the land and its people. Here I mean all human beings who rely on the, the land, the Aina, for sustenance. Climate change brings with it new challenges, but these are not the first environmental challenges or crises we have faced as indigenous peoples of Hawaii. Settler colonial dispossession through land privatization, political coup, plantation agriculture, tourism, development, and all of these for forces have reshaped the land and altered Kanaka relations with our lands, waters, skies, and our other than human relations. And when we stretch our historical frame to before the European came to our shores, we also experienced food shortages, overpopulation, political conflict and war, and we demonstrated a profound amount of ingenuity and creativity to address those problems. So we do have the capacity to solve problems because we've been doing it from the very beginning of time. So what I've learned from working with folks in the Lo'i is that in this wetland taro uh, restoration place, 
is that the creativity and ingenuity demonstrated by my ancestors is alive and well and being put to good use on a daily basis from sites across our Paiaina, our archipelago, and in communities, and also in countries across Oceania. But today I want to speak to the power of Aina for theory making and how we work with Aina, how the work how my work with Aina has helped me think beyond heteropatriarchy and with a more gender fluid lens. When we talk about gender justice in the context of climate change in Hawaii and in other settler colonial contexts, we also need to talk about decolonization and the restoration of ea, which is our Hawaiian word for life, breath, and sovereignty. In Hawaii, when we speak of decolonization, I mean the end of US occupation of our nation and lands. And when I think political decolonization is not enough, it's, it's not enough. Political decolonization is not enough, as Adriana said, right? It requires an epistemic shift, a paradigm shift in how we think about ourselves and our relationships. I mean the end of, um, so I was gonna go say that again, because we can't say it enough, end of US occupation of our nations and lands. But we must also restore Ea. Both of these projects are difficult because of how thoroughly settler colonial logics of capitalism, heteropatriarchy, and white supremacy have become sedimented in all aspects of our society, our institutions, and our intimate relationships. So I want to speak about how I'm trying to shift my thinking away from heteronormative gender binaries towards queer to spirit frame, towards a queer to spirit frame to the work of decolonization and restoration in Hawaii. And why am I doing this right now? For, so I love this place that I work. I love it, I love it, love it. I love the people who work there. But there's also, again, a lot of sexism, a gender division of labor, homophobia, that's still present in the work that we're doing. And I've been struggling to try to figure out how to address that, how to th unthink it, how to use our cultural knowledge to do some of that work of unhinging heterosexism in the land-based practices that I think are profound and transformative. So, however many years ago, when I first started working at the Lo'i as a volunteer during community work days, the staff member who led the orientation each month ended her introduction with a mo'olelo, a story of Haloa. Haloa was the firstborn son of Wakea, sky father, and Ho'oho Kukulani, the maker of stars. But when he, um, so he was their firstborn child. But when he was born, he was not alive. His devastated parents buried him beside their home. Ho'oho Kukulani's tears poured into the soil, and from that place, Kalo, or taro, the first taro plant grew. Wake and Ho'oho Kukulani would have another child, also a boy, who would grow up to become a leader. During my interview with this um, staff member years later, she told me that if volunteers remembered nothing else about their time at the Lo'i, she wanted them to remember this story, that Haloa and Kanaka are kin, that Haloa, Kalo, is the elder sibling of all Kanaka. She would stress to us that the work we were doing was about caring for our Hawaiian ancestor. I listened to Kiri, Kiri tell this story every month for more than two years. I also heard the story told at other lo'i and, and in other contexts. What, while some of the details changed from, changed from one telling to another and different storytellers emphasized and drew out different lessons, what remained consistent throughout was that Haloa was male and thus Kalo was also male. And for the longest time, I didn't think twice about Haloa and Kalo's gender. But the more I worked in the lo'i, the more familiar I became with Kalo, and, and as our relationship became more intimate, the more I came to question what I experienced as Kalo's gender. And then I read Leanne Simpson's book, As We Have Always Done, Indigenous Freedom Through Radical Resistance, where she does a queer two-spirit, two, yeah, queer two-spirit reading of some of her, her people's original stories. So I decided to take up Leanne's, when I was like, invitation. Well, I read it as an invitation. And, I just, and to follow in her footsteps and to return to my ancestors' original instructions, right, to the story of Haloa, and to read it through a two-spirit queer lens. And so what I wanna sort of like, gonna do right next is just to sort of 
walk you through what my thinking has come has been about this. So what I've been taught is that all human persons embody both male and female spirit. And I'm using spirit here following Diane Millian, who um, writes about indigenous spirit as ethos. And in Hawaiian, this duality is considered pono, balanced, correct, complementary, and co-present. This duality is not about equality, and it's not a binary. Duality is pono, perhaps, could also be exemplified in Olelo Hawaii in the Hawaiian language, where you don't have gender pronouns. We do, however, have terms for female, which is wahine, and male, which is kane. So there's clearly an understanding of differences in bodily presentation. But these differences were not, or so it seems to me, gendered along binary or heteronormative lines, where femininity is tethered to and follows femaleness, and masculinity is tethered to and follows maleness. Rather, gender might not have lined up in these ways at all. Botanically, Kalo has no gender or sex per se. Indeed, they have the capacity to reproduce in at least three ways. At the Lol'i, the most common way that Kalo reproduces is with the assistance of humans through transplantation. We cultivate the Kalo, removing its leaves and the corn while preserving the stalk called the Ha, and about the first half inch to one inch of the corn called the Kohina. The Huli, the ha, the ha and the kohina are then replanted. The same huli can be replanted many times. As the huli grows new, leaves, mat- grows new leaves and matures, they develop strong corm and oha, buds on new corm, begin to protrude from it. The buds grow and new shoots appear and, co- and we call them keiki, the child or children. If left in the crown, the kalo plant will continue to produce keiki, and those keiki will mature and be left, and if left alone, will produce more keiki. Plants that are left in the ground and allowed to continue their life cycle will produce flower or pua. We have only seen pua on a, on a handful of occasions um, because we usually harvest kalo before they re- reach their flowering stage. Um, so if, as our Mo'olelo tells us, Haloa was Kane, and thus Kalo is also Kane, then what does it mean about our ancestors' understanding of the world and gender, reproduction and procreation, that our elder sibling could birth new keiki? What can we learn from our ancestors and our elder siblings about how to express and honor gender in much more expressive and pono ways? What does it mean that the part of the huli the top one inch of corn has, that has to be present for reproduction to begin is called ko hina, ko as belonging to hina, an akua with feminine spirit that guides the rhythmic cycles of the moon and whose lunar abilities guides the rhythm of the sea. Hina embodies the gro- growth and reproduction. In the ocean, she is the coral reef, the pu koa, the coral heads of are Hina's genitalia, where she gives birth to sea urchins, seaweed, reef creatures, and their cousins of the land, water shrimp, mosses, and small ferns. In the world of my ancestor, the corm of Haloa begin, belongs to Hina. Haloa, our elder brother, births Keiki through the procreative power of Hina. Haloa and Hina are not alone in the Lo'i. Haumea is also powerfully present. Ha loa, he keiki, he kaiku ana, he ali'i is lovingly surrounded and procreatively empowered by mana wa hine in the forms of hina and haumea, which allow them to give birth to future generations. If this is indeed how my ancestors, my Owevi ancestors, understood Haloa's procreative power as being in intimate relationship with haumea and the embodiment of hina, there is no place for heteronormativity in the lo'i. My return to the Haloa story is intended to meditate on how to reconnect with our ancestors by reattaching our, quote, minds, bodies, and spirits to the network of relationships and ethical practices that generate grounded normativity. That's from Leanne Simpson. Through a pono plurality of wahine and kane, we see the generative possibilities of two-spirit queer grounded normativity enlivened in Haloa. With this alternative reading of tradition, we have an opportunity to break out of the trappings of heteronormativity, patriarchy, and homophobia. With this insight, we recognize that cultivating kalo is no more a man's job than blue is a boy's color.
These are social constructs intended to reproduce gender binaries that support heteronormativity and heteropatriarchy and continue the US occupation of our lands. And I'm offering today, what I'm offering today is an invitation to return to the original instructions of our indigenous ancestors in order to unlearn settler colonial trappings of sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. And this theoretical work is critical for decolonization and the restoration of a uh, Mahalo and aloha aina. Next speaker will be Marama Murulanin, a senior research fellow at the James and Eric uh, Research Center, the University of Auckland. Uh, to Atahi Kamihiki to Tato Kaihanga Munga Manaki Tanga Kironga Ito Tato Hui. Emihiana kia koto ngā mana, ngā reo, ngā pukenga me ngā karangaranga maha nō reira tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto. Uh, first, let me acknowledge the ancestors or the gods that are present with us today. I'd also like to extend a warm greeting to the ancestors who are uh, embedded in these lands here in New York and also to you, the audience. Um, warm greetings from New Zealand. Um, I can't believe I'm in New York. <laughs> I really can't. I feel like the, wiz uh, the witch in The Wizard of Oz, and I, I might melt in a minute because this is my big moment. <laughs> so I'd better get on with it. Um, my name is Marama, and I head a research centre at the University of Auckland. Uh, could I get you to put your hand up if you know where, or if you've been to New Zealand? Great, a few. Put your hand up if you know where New Zealand is. <laughs> right, good, I've got a captive audience then. <laughs> Quite important. Um, so today, I'm actually going to share with you uh, my latest research project. Um, and what I want to talk to you about today is the uniqueness of New Zealand and our specific climate issues. So I'll just put some slides on so to take you to New Zealand. We're just going to restart the system and hopefully that'll fix the problem. That's okay. I can just start without the pictures. <laughs> okay, I've come to New York and I've ruined the technology. Great. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today is um, unique things that happen in New Zealand in relation to climate change. And I haven't uh, heard anyone talk about the depletion of the ozone layer yet. And this is a really big problem for us in New Zealand. So I'm going to talk to you about my latest research, which is about harbours and looking after harbours. And one issue we have in New Zealand is about uh, getting sunburned. You can be out in the sun for 10 minutes and you'll be totally burnt. So you don't have this issue here in New York yet, but if you come down to New Zealand, you will be wearing sunscreen the whole time, you'll have the hat, and you won't be sunbathing on the beach. Um, still no slides. Right, I'll just read. So there's one thing I want you to do today. I want you to learn one Māori word. And the word I want you to learn is kaitiaki. Can you say that? Kaitiaki. kaitiaki. Say it again, kaitiaki. So that Māori word is a really important word, and it means to look after something. It means that you have a, a responsibility and an obligation to look after something. Now, we use this word in New Zealand, and it's now in our Resource Management Act, and they are now using Māori words in policy and legislation in New Zealand to show a certain type of relationship that local or tangata whenua or indigenous Māori have with the land. And so we consider ourselves to be kaitiaki, guardians of the land. We have a special relationship with the land. And now that, that term is actually in our legislation and in policy. So recently, I began a new area of research. In the past, in my professional life, I have looked at the kaitiaki of water and rivers in New Zealand. And when I did my PhD, I did my field work in Montreal on the St. Lawrence River. And later on in my career, I've also uh, done work in southern Chile around the Viarica Lake and the Trancura River. So I'm very interested in water and the politics of water. 
But my recent project uh, investigates kaitiaki tanga in New Zealand harbours. So this harbours space is a very new research space in New Zealand. And part of that is because now Māori have claims on harbours. So we've actually claimed rivers and we've got re relationships with the Crown and with the government and we have um, governance rights over rivers in New Zealand. But the new site, the new landscape which is open is harbours. And so uh, my project investigates the kaitiakitanga of New Zealand harbours, emphasising the work of Māori activists at multiple levels, from the shores and waters of their harbours to the steps of parliament. The word kaitiaki entered our legal system, but in practice it is often used as a convenient Māori shorthand for stakeholder without recognising that the term is deeply embedded in the culture from which it comes. The voices of kaitiaki are seldom heard beyond the, their local communities. Our research is a collaboration with Flax Roots Māori using Māori methods and provides a platform for their understanding and experiences of kaitiaki to be widely known. And that means internationally known. So this is New Zealand and um, those are the three harbours that we are going to look at, and they are all very different harbours. And I'll talk to a little bit more about them later. Now, Māori activists mobilised the word, word kaitiaki in the 1980s, particularly in the Manukau Harbour claim led by Dame Nāniko Minhinik. Now, our project also explores how kaitiakitanga has evolved since then in the context of increasing neoliberalisation in environmental management. Harbours are historically significant and environmentally, th environmentally threatened sites of Kaitiakitanga. Our project centres on the varied Kafia, Manuko, and Whangarei harbours, building from our existing relationships with these communities. Ultimately, our project aims to develop new ways of envisaging harbours, promoting Māori knowledge as instrumental in the past, present and future well-being of our harbours. So this is one of the harbours, this is the Kafia Harbour. And the Kafia Harbour is really important to me because it is the place where the Tainui Waka, or canoe, the first canoe that came with all my ancestors 800 years ago landed. So our canoe, the Taurapa, or the, the prow and the stern of our canoe are buried at this harbour and you can still see the end points. So we have real issues in this harbour because we have a rising sea level and all of our community houses are actually right up against the water. And so my tribe, my iwi, we have a claim for the harbour but we also have this very real issue of the water uh, actually wanting to encroach on the land that we're actually trying to claim for. So when I talk about harbours, I'm not only talking about water, I'm talking about the land and water, that intersection between the two places. So, mai hawaiki nui ki whangaparaua, huri ki tāmaki, ki whangarei, ka huki anō ki tāmaki, whiti atu ki manukunuka o hotiroa, ka haere ki mōkau, ka taka te punga, ka huki ake ki kāwhia kai, kāwhia tangata, kāwhia moana, ka tū ko hani rawa ko pane, you know, what was all that about. So that is a traditional tauraparapa, and my father recited that tauraparapa for us to locate our project. And the project is actually what we call a rural society project, so it's one of the main projects picked for New Zealand to actually do blue skies research. And so that's what we have. We have a blue skies research team. Um, this kōrero hikoi, or tauraparapa, traces the harbour routes travelled by the Tainui canoe, which is said to have been guided into the Kafia harbour by pana ira ira, a shapeshifter, or kaitiaki. Our research focuses on kaitiakitanga and on harbours, stemming, stemming from the intersection of these in the Manukau harbour, led by Dame Nāneko Minhinik. So this is another harbour here, this is the Whangarei harbour in the north, which is quite different to the Kafia Harbour. Kafia Harbour is a very Māori harbour. Lots of Māoris living around it. It's a fishing harbour. It doesn't have a port. This harbour here, the Whangarei Harbour, is what our Deputy Prime Minister wants to develop uh, for the big port in New Zealand. And the people here are very disturbed by this prospect. I talked about Dame Nāne Minhinik. She is the one, she's got the diamond on her head. 
This other woman here is a woman by the name of Eva Rickard, and then you have the young woman is Panya Newton. Why have I got these three women on that slide? In New Zealand, uh, the kaitiaki, or the, the people who are well known for uh, looking after harbours are actually women. Not men, it's women. So it's been women uh, in New Zealand who have been the key advocates for making sure that our harbours are protected. So, Dame Nainiko Minhinik, uh, which was central to kaitiakitanga becoming a key concept in law and policy. Now, we investigate kaitiakitanga as an ethic and flax root politic, emphasising the work of community activists at multiple levels, from the shores and waters of their harbours to the steps of parliament. Kaitiaki and kaitiakitanga, these words were mobilised by Māori activists in the 1980s in strategic campaigns to defend their lands and waters from environmental desecration. The inclusion of kaitiakitanga in legislation and policy developed in the context of increasing neoliberal and third way policies and politics where the government sought to devolve many of its responsibilities to stakeholders. Central, to local central and local government tend to use the term kaitiaki as a convenient Māori shorthand for stakeholder, recognising Māori interests and requesting their labour without relinquishing power or offering any reward. This project we are going to do provides a fuller description of kaitiakitanga, including its evolution since the 1980s and the impact of law and policy on its practice today. Harbours. We focus on the critically important and threatened environment of harbours. When the first voyagers arrived in New Zealand, they sought bay, they sought, sought whanga. This is, uh, a whanga is a sheltered bay in which to draw up their canoes and come into land. Hundreds of years later, the first Europeans did the same thing. New Zealand's harbours are and have always been coveted and contested sites for navigation, industry, fishing, recreation and settlement. Historically, they are important places of meeting, negotiation and exchange. They are where land and sea and people come together. Yet, there has never been a comprehensive study of harbours and their significance to New Zealand or to Māori. Most written histories of individual harbours, if they mention Māori history at all, sail over it swiftly and shallowly before moving on to a narrative about Western industry. So what are the stories Māori tell about their harbours and their relationships with harbours? How do kaitiaki understand these places and how to best use and care for them? Our project arose out of conversations with Flax Roots Māori. Despite the prevalence of kaitiaki kōrero in the literature, the, voice of those, the voices of those with daily responsibility for it are seldom heard. Our case study approach of the different harbours, building from our established established relationships with Māori communities in two regions, is necessary to explore the diverse local expressions of kaitiakitanga. Through our collaborations with local Māori from the harbours, we will investigate ways in which Māori knowledge and kaitiakitanga and other Māori-related terms interact with local and central government ways of knowing and treating the environment. We will explore kaitiakitanga as a political movement and as a network of concepts and relationships, varying between places and communities and changing over time. We will listen to and gather the stories of the Kafia, Manukau and Whangarei Harbour. These harbours cover a range of ecological states, threats, economic uses and inter-iwi relationships. By the way, iwi means tribe. This project is not a comparative study, but an in-depth study of stewardship over harbours based on detailed case study analysis. The three sites put in a national context by analysing documentary resources on kaitiakitanga across the islands. Our focus on harbours allows us to look at the dynamics of land and sea guardianship as well as the multiple human relationships that are drawn together through harbours. The narrow bureaucratic space in which central and local government allow for kaitiakitanga often hinders its full exercise and fails to cater for the wider obligations, rights and spiritual dimensions that are fundamental to it. The first kaitiaki were gods and shapeshifters and other natural phenomenon. 
We seek to learn how people have enacted kaitiakitanga in their daily lives in continuation of tradition and in response to environmental degradation and appropriation. Kaitiakitanga today takes various forms from upholding, uh, from upholding, what's my writing? Oh, from upholding customary practices, interactions with the environment, and passing knowledge on to future generations, to political work in conversation and contest with the state, such as letter writing, submission writing, legal action, and protest. Our study will go beyond the dominant voices of tribal spokesperson, spokespeople who are given preference by the Crown, government, and tribal, agent, tribal authorities. We are committed to including the full range of community voices, including the voices of komatua and rangatahi. Now, the words komatua and rangatahi, they're Māori words. Komatua means elder, elders with no gender, and rangatahi means youth with no gender. So we have many Māori words that actually are not gendered words for people. Um, it also takes into account Māori women. So women's leadership is especially important as it is underrepresented in existing literature. Strong women such as Nani Kumahinik, Eva Rickard, Angeline Greensill, Carmen Kirkwood, Dale Takitimu, and others less well known have played a fundamental role in the, in the activation of kaitiakitanga in relation to harbours. Furthermore, there is a rich his, history of ancestors associated with harbours. The time for this research is now. Harbours are under accelerating threat and environmental pressure. Māori communities living on harbours are increasingly affected by climate change. Harbours around the country are the subject of multiple claims under the Marine and Coastal Area Act and the Waitangi Tribunal claims. Uh, claims over harbours are yet to be settled and are at the forefront of the next wave of treaty settlements. So that was just the taster of our project. And I just want to show you my, my this is my new team and I uh, am supposed to lead this team. On this team, we have a um, partner in a law firm. He's an environmental lawyer. We have a treaty settlements negotiator who is also a governance expert. We have an oral historian who's worked for the Office of Treaty Settlements and Ngahuya, that is my PhD student. So we have everything. It's a very interdisciplinary team. And um, we had our first week of research last week in Kafia, and it's an exciting project. So. That's all I really wanted to say. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ratātou, katoa. Our next speaker is Dean Itsuji Saranilio, and he is an Associate Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the organizers of today's conference. Uh, thank you so much to the fellow, fellow panelists, um, and thank you so much to all of you for staying um, to the, for the second session, or second to the last session of the day. Um, this is just a bit of a caveat. This is not actually my research. Um, I study something a little bit different. This is more of um, a kind of decision that I made last minute given all of the conversations that have been taking place today. Um, and so, um, Let's go into it. So as Hawaii state leaders play a zero-sum game that disregards the growing numbers of people united in protecting sacred Mauna Awa Kea from further desecration by the 30-meter telescope, Kia'i or protectors, continue to inspire and further demonstrate to all of Hawaii and the world the power of indigenous movements to create meaningful alternatives to an unsustainable U.S. colonial system. While at tremendous sacrifice to the revered kupuna, or elders, who are arrested yet continue to block the access road along with the thousands of other kia'i or protectors who have thrived at Puohonua Puohuluhulu, the resurgence of Hawaiian ways of knowing, being, and responding to the ongoing history of settler colonialism is historic, truly transformational, and offers a glimpse of a beautiful future during unsettling times. After more than 100 years of the U.S. occupation of Hawaii, the United States has proven themselves time and time again as incapable of protecting the resources and relations that sustain life in the islands. And it is time and time again Kanaka Uiwi land-based movements that have educated the state and general public about the impact of such harm and offered another way forward. Whether we are talking about an industrial food system that imports 85 to 90% of its food, 
the military's continued use of Hawaiian lands for live fire military training, water divergence from watersheds that replaced Hawaiian foodways with industrial sugar production and aided the introduction of capitalism in the islands, the attempts to genetically modify the taro plant Haloa, the elder sibling of Kanaka Maoli uh, that Hoku talked about, or the continued use of Hawaii for herbicide and pesticide testing by multinational corporations, there have been native peoples resisting and educating at nearly every moment of environmental degradation, though this is far from a comprehensive list. So yet, much of this transformational power is lost when one listens to 30 meter telescope proponents who cast the issue simplistically as one of culture versus science. Indeed, this false binary, one that pits Hawaiian knowledge against Western science, and not only paints the former as inferior, but the latter as indispensable to human progress, is not new, but has been repeatedly levied against Hawaiians. For instance, this conflict played itself out on an international stage in 1893, long before the 30-meter telescope, and was used as justification for the overthrow of an independent Hawaiian nation. Understanding the power of such tropes matters because Hawaiians can be made to suffer the consequences of such racist characterizations against them. It's only 10 months after helping to lead the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom, Lauren A. Thurston was in Chicago at the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Thurston, a third generation settler of some of the first American missionaries to Hawaii, was managing his Kilauea Cyclorama, a five-story high and 400-foot wide landscape painting of Kilauea Volcano designed to encircle the viewer and give the impression of standing in the actual crater. So placing large American flags at the top of the cyclorama, Thurston used his cyclorama as a kind of advertisement, a kind of imperial advertisement for annexation. Thurston's Kilauea cyclorama represented Hawaii as a place where American civilization and native savagery met. Keeping in line with the idea that quote unquote primitives were at the very beginning of human progress, Hawaii, as represented through Kilauea Volcano, was a geological symbol of the absolute beginning stages of development, a place on Earth at its most primitive state. At the same time, this was done through the most modern form of Western technological entertainment in existence, the cyclorama. Considered to be all the rage in America, cycloramas or panoramas are the predecessor to motion picture film and movie theaters, and atop the cyclorama was a statue of Pele, described as the goddess of fire, and was said to be the second largest statue at the exposition. The landscape painting of Kilauea featured a geologist walking and studying within the crater. Can you guys see him? He's, yeah. Okay. So thus juxtaposing two competing knowledges about one location. As a people who were seen as having a more advanced knowledge of the crater, settlers could argue that they were more deserved over that space. And this is exactly the same tactics that proponents of the 30-meter telescope use to dismiss Hawaiians as anti-science. It is important to understand, however, that this is not two competing knowledges so much as two representations set by the same racist imagination. Thurston's fictive depiction of Hawaiian culture as anti-science allowed him and other settlers to render themselves as the, as the masculine embodiment of scientific reason. In fact, the initial plans for the Hawaii exhibit by Kanaka Uivi themselves at the Columbian Exposition, prior to being assert by Thurston, were designed with science in mind. So historian Kelani Cook points out how the Halenawa, a royal society that reflected a quote, new pro-native national culture, were deeply aware of racist imaginings of Hawaiian people and plan planned to win the public over at the 1893 Columbian Exposition via sports, culture, and contributing to an international movement for science. Cook explains, quote, the message the Halenawa intended to send was clear. Hawaii, while proudly retaining an explicitly native culture, was still proficient in the cultural forms of Europe and America. And so false representations of Pele, combined with the science of geology, sought to trivialize Hawaiian cultural associations with place. In fact, Thurston and his geologists often spoke of geology as a war between civilization and the female power of Pele. Thomas Jagger, an early geologist who was funded by Thurston, would eventually name his book, Volcanoes Declare War, in which he writes about his and Thurston's involvement in the 1935 US Army's dropping of six tons of bombs on the lava flow from Mauna Loa. 
The portrayal of Pele in the secular Rama seemingly demanded control of an uncontrollable native woman, and this here links tightly with how the overthrow of Lilu Okalani was described in January of 1893. Thurston described Lilu Okalani as a quote-unquote dangerous woman who was overthrown for attempting to promulgate a new constitution, one that would restore a system of checks and balances and full political vote to Kanaka Uwivi. And for this, Lilu Okalani was characterized as dangerous to quote-unquote American lives and property, which seemingly justified the landing of U.S. Marines to occupy Hawaii. History repeated itself in 2019 when, describing Mauna Kea protectors as creating a dangerous situation, Governor David Ige used Hawaiian opposition to the 30-meter telescope to justify his emergency declaration justifying the use of the National Guard, not unlike Thurston's fabricated emergency and characterizations of Queen Lu'okalani. And so despite pro-TMT supporters who paint the movement to protect Mauna Wakea as anti-science, or as coming at the expense of non-Hawaiians, it is the Mauna Kea movement in Hawaii that is to the greatest benefit to all of Hawaii's people. Together, they are redefining what is even imagined as possible as they have organized numerous forms of mutual care at the Puhonua relating to education, child care, medical care, ride shares, waste recycling, and food. Those protecting the Mauna, the mountain, have also forged powerful connections with other global movements who similarly understand the urgency to protect the very conditions that sustain life on this planet. Whether we are talking about Standing Rock and the protection of water, Guam or Guam and the protection of sacred places from military live fire training, which is also about water. Um, they're trying to place that live fire training site directly above the island's aquifer. The exposing and ousting of Puerto Rico governor, not to mention other global movements against the state-sponsored massacres in the Philippines and land struggles in Aotearoa, this is the new normal of our times, as governments continue to prioritize a form of economic development that is militarized and intensely anti-life. But the unearthing of buried histories regarding Hawaii's occupation by the United States reveal how the state's present authority was taken historically by illegal force. What the settler state has done with this power is revealed in the present and possibly future realities of rising sea levels, environmental degradation, increased militarism, and growing social and economic discord caused by other acts of desecration. A hundred years later, the cyclorama of Kilauea is irrelevant, just as a 30-meter telescope will be, but the issue of desecration and occupation will remain ever-present. The 30-meter telescope epitomizes the failure of settler colonialism, which has the intellectual capacity to peer into the universe, but lacks any wisdom to protect life on this planet. Indeed, July 2019, the month when the blocking of construction of the TMT was most tense, has also been determined to be the hottest month ever in recorded history. The longer it takes for settler states to occupy, I believe the more urgent climate crisis will become. Thank you. The final panelists today will be Paige West, the Claritau Professor of Anthropology here at Barnard. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? So I had a very different, oh, you can really hear me, sorry. Um, I had a very different talk that I was going to give that's based on a new book uh, that I have coming out called Anti, A Prayer for the World. But my colleagues on the earlier panel and today have inspired me to do something I never do, which is wing it a little bit. So here we go. <laughs> um, I want to thank the organizers. BCRW always does amazing events, and the students always are fantastic. So thank you, students. Thank you also to all of you for coming today, for the students and the audience. Thank you to my colleagues and friends. It's nice to be on a panel with people you love, which doesn't always happen for academics. Um, so today, I want to tell you a little bit about one of the places and some of the people who bear the burden of Euro-American or Western or Northern, depending on your perception, um, your perspective, over consumption. So I'm an environmental anthropologist, and I see and understand the biophysical world around us in terms of human actions, behaviors, and ideologies. Climate change, in my mind, is a human-generated problem that's directly connected to consumption and resource extraction. And that consumption has taken place here in the United States, in Europe, and in the other overdeveloped countries. For the past 24 years, I've had the honor of conducting anthropological research on the island of New Guinea and the country Papua New Guinea, 
a place where overconsumption is not a problem, but one of the places where the first drastic effects of climate change are being seen. So the island of New Guinea, which is the second largest island in the world, sits directly under the equator and north of Australia. At 786,000 kilometers square, it's less than one half of 1% of the Earth's surface, but it contains about 10% of the species on our planet. And many of these species are endemic, meaning found only in New Guinea. I could give you lots and lots of numbers, but an example is there are over 200,000 insect, spe insect species, over 20,000 plant species, and over 725 bird species, over 400 amphibian species, and 455 butterfly species, just in the place where I conducted my initial field work in Papua New Guinea. This is mega diversity, and I keep saying over and over again, because almost any time a scientist goes to New Guinea, they discover, and I say that in quotes because people in New Guinea already knew it was all there, but they find something that is unknown to their science. And I'm not even going to get started on the marine diversity, but imagine a marine ecosystem that has all of the diversity of the Indonesian reef system and the Great Barrier Reef system, and then imagine something called the Western Pacific Warm Pool, the warmest water on our planet. So very, very good water for biodiversity. Terrestrially, the island of New Guinea and its has many, terrestrially, New Guinea and its many surrounding smaller islands have montane rainforests, subalpine grasslands, mangrove forests, lowland rainforests, freshwater swamps, savannas, grasslands, and one of the world's last remaining tropical glaciers. So the island of New Guinea is split in half by an international border. The western half is called West Papua, and it's a settler colony of Indonesia. And I urge you all to Google West Papuan genocide when you get home. I don't have time to talk about that today. But it's an ongoing genocide that is tied directly to resource extraction that is underpinned by both the United States and our consumption and by the Indonesian military and their desire to protect gold mines. The eastern half is called Papua New Guinea. It's a former colony of Australia that's been independent since 1975. So in addition to the mainland, Papua New Guinea is also made up of hundreds of islands to its north and south and west. The country of Papua New Guinea, the mainland and its islands combined, is slightly bigger than California with about six million residents. And to give you a comparison here, California has about 36 and a half million residents. So let me say this again, Papua New Guinea and California are just about the same size, and Papua New Guinea has six million residents, while California has 36 and a half million residents. Papua New Guinea also has 860 different languages. And this means that the indigenous people of Papua New Guinea are one of the most heterogeneous populations in the world. They're divided into several thousand separate communities, and these communities are divided by language, custom, and tradition. And almost all of these people, over 80% 80, 80 of them, live in rural areas. The majority of them live in villages without access to power, roads, much less shopping centers or stores. The majority of Papua New Guineans, about 75% of them, are also horticulturalists. They grow their own food on their own lands. They fish, they hunt, and they do things that their ancestors have done for a very long time. And Papua New Guinea is also unique because 97% of the land in the country is owned by the indigenous people. So when I think about consumption, I think about consumption and resource extraction as ongoing acts of colonialism that we are all taking part in ongoing colonialism every single day when we consume, and in particular, when we consume fossil fuels. I want to talk now about climate change issues in Papua New Guinea, and so many of them have already been uh, talked about today, so I'll just run through them. There's sea, level, there's sea level rise. There's the salinization of fields for growing. There's declining biodiversity, and people depend on biodiversity for their livelihood. Remember I said eight, over 80% 80 of the people live in rural areas? They depend on biodiversity not because of the beauty of it, not because of it's interesting to tourists, but because they eat it up and it's how they stay alive. One of the other things that's happening there is intensified storms and storm surges, king tides that have always happened, hurricanes that have always happened are getting worse and worse. There's also extreme heat and there's extreme drought now. They're also changing disease vectors, and so the biggest one that we worry about in Papua New Guinea is malaria, but also things like filariasis and other diseases. There's increased migration within the country, and there's increased urbanization, and all of these are tied to climate change. So how does funding happen 
when we think about mitigating these effects of climate change in a place like Papua New Guinea and in places across our world. Funding also happens through a process of ongoing colonization. So people in the United States, Europe, and other Western, Northern, however you think about it, come up with funding points, things that they think are going to help mitigate climate change. These big organizations then put out calls for proposals, and lots and lots of people apply, including big international environmental organizations and big giant companies that work to manage projects overseas, many of these companies located in New York and in Washington, D.C. The calls for proposals from big multilateral funding organizations are almost always given, or the, the money is almost always given to big organizations and not small organizations. It is argued over and over and over again that small local NGOs do not have the, quote, capacity to manage funding of this kind, and they do not have the, quote, capacity to actually take on the problems of climate change. Many of the partnerships between these big international NGOs are actually partnerships with the very resource extraction companies that, sought, that caused this problem in the first place. Many of the big international conservation organizations are partnered with companies like ExxonMobil, a company that denied its knowledge of climate change for years and years until the Columbia Journalism School busted that open and showed that they actually did know, and a company that has a former executive um, Rex Tillerson, who recently said that he absolutely knew about climate change and believed that it was happening during his entire tenure at ExxonMobil, but he didn't do anything about it. He didn't change the company's practices. And additionally, he said that he doesn't think that there's anything that we can do now. And so, well, we can talk about that later. Ask me a question about what I think that's about. Um, <laughs> and so what happens with this money? There's a notion that the money will then trickle down to communities, that the money will trickle down to small-scale conservation organizations, and that these organizations will then be able to do good work in the world. But all of the ideas about what needs to be done are coming from big organizations and from these very large multilateral funding organizations. One of the things that this does is basically create impossible conditions for small local NGOs. And these are the people that are on the ground that actually know what's going on. They know what communities want, they know what communities need, and they actually know what we can do to mitigate climate change at the very local level. These, fundings, these funding mechanisms that give money almost exclusively to big international NGOs are actually driving small NGOs across the world out of business. I want to talk very briefly about two that I've had the pleasure of working with, the Papua New Guinea Institute of Biological Research, which I co-founded in 2005 with colleagues from Papua New Guinea, which was driven out of business by a big NGO because they took all the money. And Islands Awareness, which is a small marine-based NGO that I've worked with since 2007. Its founder and director, John Eine, is someone that I think of as a brother, and John is currently in a funding crisis because all of the money for the work that he does is going to big international NGOs. This is an ongoing form of colonialism, and I don't think we talk about it enough like that. Um, I want to end with a challenge to everyone in the audience, um, and I want that challenge to kind of be twofold. One. You know, one of the things that I've learned from my colleagues from the Pacific is that for all of us doing research, we need to be actually working with communities in a way that is driven by communities. And all of our work needs to feed back into what communities want and need. There's a sticky point with getting tenure at a U.S. institution and doing that kind of work. Um, and so I want all of, the all of my colleagues in the room and everyone who has the ability to transform the tenure and promotion system at U.S. institutions um, to take note that the only way that we can actually address the problems of climate change is for scholars like me. Well, I have tenure, so I'm good. But for our <laughs> scholars, our young colleagues, to be able to partner with communities in new and innovative ways and to do projects that are driven by what communities want and need, and we need to value those in a way that we have not done in the past. We also have to value collaboration. And one of the things that we see across universities is that women of color 
and white women actually do the majority of the collaborative work that's done in academic institutions. Collaborations are not as valued for tenure and promotion as other kinds of singular, um, single research, so we should value collaborations more and we should tenure and promote those people. And I'd also like to end with all of us thinking about consumption and resource extraction because there's a way in which there's an increasing slippage around what we need to do. There's a lot of pressure, and it's a very neoliberal pressure, put on us as individuals to do things or not do things. And you know, I don't have a car, I don't have kids, I don't eat meat usually. There's lots of stuff that we can do that's good for the planet, but the main thing that we can do that is good for the planet is not about individuals, it is about collectively forcing fossil fuel companies to stop doing what they're doing, and all of us here forcing these institutions to divest. Before I open up to the audience, I want to just grab some time here with uh, the panel. And I want to start with um, Dean's idea of the failure of capitalism, right, and the failure of imperialism to think about the successes of indigenous knowledges uh, that um, Hoku and um, Marma talk about. Um, and to sort of link that together, to think about <clears throat> that these indigenous knowledges, we already know how to live in the planet, right? Without um, extractive resource, the resources, without destroying it, without uh, um, baking in social inequity, right? Indigenous uh, communities already know how to do that. And so I want to sort of suggest and maybe open this up for a discussion around what that looks like um, when it's sort of more writ large and, and not I don't want to just say not just in the local sense, but you know, in these sort of um, collaborative locals getting getting together, right? And, and one way I was thinking, and this draws on what happened in the, was talked about and discussed and brought up in the last panel um, of this rethinking, right? Some of this is also a rethinking of indigeneity and these the idea that the you know the islands. Um, and this is a Eurocentric imperialist imaginary, right, that was put on um, the islands in the Caribbean and the islands in the Pacific. Um, and I want to draw on Tongan scholar Apeli Halfa's sort of reformulation of the idea of the ocean. One, um, as I tell my students, is that the, we really have one ocean, and it it's, covers far more area than the landmass on this planet, right? So actually, uh, and so drawing on Hofa's idea, which is um, that the oceans are not these vast emptinesses with scattered land masses on them, but they are connected rather than separated by water, right? And so I want to think about how rethinking the size of the peoples in, the, in these islands everywhere, right? That we're actually possessor, possessors of more territory and area than the people on the land masses, right? And to sort of switch that and flip that thinking to sort of think about, okay, and back again to, you know, in, indigenous um, peoples have lived successfully within those, because they are not just on the land, they're also in the water, right? And to think about that, and they're also, um, as Adriana brought up, and, you know, we can talk about the Hokulea, right? That, um, <clears throat> that there has been all this traffic in the water, they, you know, it wasn't like these isolated land masses, right? They were in communication. Um, and so I'm just sort of throwing out some of those ideas to. Yeah, I'm, I don't know where to start. Because <laughs> there's so many things. I mean, there's so many ways to go and to think about this and to think about um, that, that we do have, like we, like indigenous peoples do know how to live on the lands because we have lived on the lands. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that those lands are usually our kin and our relations, and and that um, through colonization we've forgotten how to how to live well with them, and and that we have to relearn how to do that. And so, and um, and that when we do it best, it isn't through a capitalist framework, but through a cooperative relational framework. And so that makes perfect sense to me. And also about how, and again, this is where I think we, what we're talking about is builds on the panel that came before, about how, call the con, how 
continued colonization in the way the page talks about it and others, like we have to attend to colonization over and over and over again in these multiple scales, in these multiple institutions, in these multiple ways that are, you know, ideological, institutional. So it's such a challenge. And the exciting thing is that folks are doing things on the ground. And when I think about, okay, that's where I was going, was I was thinking about Mauna Kea. And I was thinking about the TMT and the protests and how quickly folks at Pu'uhuluhulu were able to mobilize and organize and set up an encampment, a mini city, that is far more sophisticated than, you know, any other town in Hawaii, um, almost overnight. And I think about, um, the reason why folks are able to do that is because of projects like the one I work with at Kaka'o'o Weavey and, and this wetland restoration project and the fish pond and the forest restoration and all of these what my student calls um, uh, the cultural kipuka network, right? Cultural kipuka. Kipuka are oases of, of uh, cultural knowledge. Um, and those were places where um, knowledge keepers were able to continue those practices. And what's happened over the past 20, 30 years, nah, 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 not 30, maybe 20, is that there's been little kipuka popping up all over and they've networked, we've all networked with each other such that when Mauna Kea happened, they were able to mobilize. Folks had the skills and the, re and, and the knowledge and the relationships with others to be able to establish something radically different. And that's, I think, part of the sort of the genealogy that leads us to be able to do this. And I think that's, I think, what speaks to the power and potential of the local and that we have to cautiously think about what we mean by scaling up, right? Because again, if we scale too far, then we run into the same kinds of challenges and, and mm problems that, that, that Paige is speaking, right? That it just goes to the big, you know, the big companies. Yeah, and so that's, that's I guess, where I want to say. Um, so since we're talking about Hawaii, then I'll just chime in. Um, I think Hawaii really gives you the, the kind of perfect example for understanding how capitalism is neither sustainable as an economic system, nor is it sustainable environmentally. And so Hawaii's um, occupation by the United States increases every time the United States is in a period of economic depression. So in the 1890s, that leads to the McKinley Tariff um, and that the 1890 economic crisis, that leads to Hawaii's occupation by the United States so that they could use Hawaii as a stepping stone to markets in China. And then in the 1930s, you have another economic depression and this is when the sugar planters decide that they need to incorporate Hawaii so that they don't have to pay tariffs to the United States. And then in the 1950s, which is when statehood, 59 is when statehood is achieved, they wanted statehood because they couldn't get large loans as long as Hawaii was a territory and not a state. Um, and so all of these kinds of things eventually lead to what currently exists. Um, and I think exactly what Hoku is talking about, the people who are on the ground understand that this system is neither sustainable nor is it nourishing people's souls or joy so that working on the land allows them a capacity to create autonomy. And that autonomy is actually the material conditions of resistance so that you're not relying on nonprofits to do resistance. You're not relying on paychecks to do resistance. And um, Hoku started with the word ea um, and Imai Kalani Winchester, who is a teacher at Hala Kumana, which is a Hawaiian charter school that uses indigenous knowledge to structure his curriculum, um, he shared with me this one definition of ea, which means, um, which means sovereignty or autonomy, it also means life and breath. But he says ea also means waking up in the morning and deciding whether or not you go to work. And that necessitates a kind of abundance. And that is a kind of freedom that I think many of us can't even imagine because we live in a kind of governmentality of scarcity. Mm -hmm. And so this other kind of economy, the indigenous economy, is itself a kind of, we all heard about that kind of way of thinking about slow violence, but I think it's also a form of slow resistance. Mm -hmm. 
It's a non-spectacle way of resisting that actually allows one to set up future generations to succeed in ways that we potentially cannot in this current moment. Okay, I'm going to try and say something, but your question was pretty all over the place. <laughs> I'll be honest. Yes. Okay. So the one thing I think I can speak to is about the notion of indigenous knowledge. And in New Zealand, we call it mātauranga Māori, which means Māori knowledge. Now, Māori knowledge is not just one thing. Māori knowledge is Māori knowledge is, because every family, every subgroup, every tribal group, they have their own knowledge. Now, this is not esoteric knowledge. It is intergenerational knowledge that is passed down through families, usually, or marae communities. So what is interesting at the moment in New Zealand is that many of our relationships with the government and the Crown are based on conversations between our iwi, our tribal representatives, and government. The iwi is a creation, uh, and the iwi actually doesn't have knowledge because knowledge is passed down intergenerationally, and it is between uh, family members like fathers and sons or aunts and daughters, and the, 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 the knowledge is often doing something. It's local knowledge. For example, I live on a river. Oh, I don't anymore, but I have. And so where we live on the river, there is a special way of catching eels. We catch them with a hand line because the river runs very quickly through, the part of the, through our territory. That is a very local knowledge. We have a special way of putting the hook on the, on the, the line. We do it at night with torches. The river where we are is very deep. Now, 300 kilometers down the river, it's a completely different way of catching eels, and they use nets. The river is shallower, the river is, um, it's, it's different fishing, different eeling grounds. So what I'm trying to say is that when we're talking about indigenous knowledge, there's not just this one big indigenous knowledge, and there's not even a Maori knowledge. There are what we call local family hapu knowledges, and those knowledges are guarded, because you uh, get the knowledge is a type of uh, initiation. Not all knowledge is, is meant to be for you. Now, not all knowledge is actually meant to be put on a PowerPoint projection, as well, a PowerPoint projector. So you have this, I go back to the word kaitiaki, you have a responsibility to guard that knowledge and give that knowledge to the right person. So to suddenly take Māori knowledge and make it available to anybody in a university would actually kill relationships within Indigenous cultures. So... I am a kaitiaki of Māori knowledge. In the tribe that I'm from, we have what's known as the Wakatoa people. We have men that know how to row canoes on fast-flowing rivers. That knowledge is specifically for men. I am not privy to that knowledge. I know about that knowledge because my brothers have done it and my uncles have done it, but it is not my job to share that knowledge, and it is certainly not my job to create a course about fast flow a river, you know, wakatoa knowledge and put it in a university. So there are all sorts of sanctions and responsibilities that come with those types of knowledges. I just want to put that out there to you, that it's not open slather, you know, mm -hmm. and when you're talking about scaling up, these are the problems with scaling up. But if you look closely, you'll see on my ears that I have these, they're actually teeth, they're shark's teeth. And, and um, I was at, having breakfast this morning and the girl making my coffee, she said, oh, I haven't got my ears pierced, but if I could get some earrings, I'd get them just like that. I love those earrings. And I said, oh, they're the teeth of a shark. And she said, oh, they're so cool. I wonder where I could get some from. And I was thinking, well, to get these earrings, you have to kill the shark. <laughs> So though, you know, when Paige is talking about consumerism, you have to sometimes think about what's at stake. When you get these flash earrings, you've killed a whole shark for two teeth. Well, many earrings were made out of that shark, but 
those are the sorts of stories that my grandparents tell me, and that's my tauranga Māori, remembering that something has to die for these things to hang on my ears. Those are the consequences, and that's, you know, that makes consumption. When you know the story behind what's, how it got there, you suddenly think, well, maybe I don't need those earrings. But I'll pass these earrings on to my daughter, and I'll tell her the story. And that is what my tauranga Māori is all about. It's about the relationships. You don't get that in a university. So I'll, I'll just say real quickly, I mean, this strikes me as connected to one of the things that Adriana said during her presentation earlier, that the work done to keep indigenous folks and others from talking among themselves is a particular kind of political work. And we need to think about the historical material and discursive regimes that keep people from talking across difference. We also see this here in the United States. Nobody in power in the United States wants poor black people and poor white people and poor Latino people to talk to each other because that terrifies power. And so one of the institutions that's actually doing some interesting work around this is um, a scholar named Eleanor Sterling and colleagues of hers at the University of Hawaii and at the Center for Biodiversity Conservation at the American Museum of Natural History. They've worked to create some networks between small scale indigenous conservation organizations across the Pacific and have people talking to each other without people that don't belong in those communities as part of those conversations. Mm -hmm. So part of it is relinquishing the kind of fantasy that if you facilitate something, you still have to be part of it. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm getting the signal we need to get onto the next part of the program. Um, so I invite anybody who has questions to come up and talk to the panelists. Um, and I'm sorry that we're going to not have time for um, audience questions. So thank you. Thank you.